It's good to see you all. Uh, happy Easter. Um, it is a joyous occasion. It is our most joyous of occasions as the church, as Christians. Uh, it has been a wonderful week, a full week, a week of worship, a week of gathering together, a week of telling this old, old story and remember, remembering the promise and sacrifice that our Lord made for us. And so we began with Palm Sunday, had the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, uh, and then we told the passion story. And then we had Maundy Thursday and remembered the commandment that our Lord gave us to love one another. We had Good Friday, and we remembered and saw the story of Jesus being crucified and laid in the tomb, and today we speak of the resurrection. And in the middle of it all, we had Let Down Wednesday. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Wednesday morning, we got up and heard that this great storm was coming, <laughs> and that hail the size of softballs and grapefruits were going to come. And it harkened back to one of the ten plagues in the Old Testament. And I thought, well, this isn't something we need to take seriously until uh, I saw that the South Lake school system was closing their schools a little early so that all the kids could get home before the, the hail, the giant hail. And I remembered uh, at a, a Bite of Grace softball one time seeing a softball hit Tom Brownsfield windshield. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> it's kind of funny for the rest of us, but... And I thought, well, I don't want that to happen to my car, so I need to figure out how to, how to hide my cars or put them under shelter because we're from the north. And like other people from the north, here, our garage is used for what our basement should be used for. So it has all our stuff, right? Stuff that is just, we've accumulated and moved from here to there. To, we don't, I don't even know what's in the boxes anymore, but I know where it is. And so my mother-in-law is in town, so we had her car, my car, Michelle's car. So we, we made a spot just big enough for my mother-in-law's car, because hers is the smallest. And then we parked Michelle's car at South Lake Town Center. And then we parked my car at a hospital, because like the rest of South Lake had the same idea, and so there was nowhere to park. And so we had our cars under protected concrete barriers, and then we had my mother-in-law's car in our garage, and we were ready. We were hunkered down. We were ready for whatever the sky could throw at us. And we waited. And we waited. And nothing happened. And, uh, and so I follow Pete Delkis on Twitter. Pete Delkis, our local weatherman. And you should have seen, I mean, <laughs> Twitter brings out the best of us, right? You should have seen the things that people were saying to the weatherman. Like, how did you get this so wrong? How do you get to do this for a living and be wrong? And it was like everybody was so disappointed that their houses weren't destroyed by grapefruit <laughs> grenades. Um, but, but here's what's true. Is if you say something is going to happen, others expect it to happen. If you say something is going to happen, others expect it to happen. Unless, of course, you're Jesus. Because the women, they go to the tomb. The women, the women go to prepare his body for burial, and they meet the angels, and the angels say, He is not here. He is risen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He has risen just like he said he would. He told you this was going to happen. Remember what he said in Galilee, that he was going to be arrested, crucified, and three days later he was going to rise again. If there's one thing we can say about Jesus is that if he says something is going to happen, it happens. If he says something is going to happen, it happens. Now, we have the, the luxury of looking back at the resurrection through, through the lens of history. We weren't there over the course of those three days. We didn't watch him die, and we didn't uh, uh, give up all hope and then have the joy of the resurrection. But there are other things that Jesus says to us today. Jesus says these things are going to happen and asks us to believe, to trust that these things actually will happen. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, from our reading earlier. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Jesus says your sins are forgiven. That is going to happen. Your sins are going to be forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. So for thousands of years, human beings have had this relationship with God where we've understood it as God saying, do this, don't do that, and you will have a good life. You will be blessed. God will do good things for you. But if you don't do this and instead do that, you will be punished. 
That is how this thing is going to work. That is how a lot of life works. If you do what is right, good things happen. And if you do what is wrong, they don't. And so we have this vision, this understanding of a God who is watching everything we do and waiting to punish us when we step out of line. And it is a vision of God that is is difficult. We look at God and we don't see God as loving. We see God as judging, as waiting to act. But Jesus says, no, that's not the way it is. Folks, that's not the truth. The truth is God has forgiven you. God will continue to forgive every sin going forward. God does not hold grudges. Jesus has said that this is going to happen, that this has already happened. Trust that this is true. God does not hold grudges. And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, In Christ all will be made alive. In Christ all will be made alive. I um, was sitting over here watching the choir sing and the orchestra, and I, was just, I just had this moment. I was looking back in my mind on, on, on what this space used to be. This was a gymnasium. And how we have turned this space into this place where we gather to worship, uh, and, and how this is our, our ninth year, our ninth Easter, the ninth time we have gathered to say, He is risen, and you say, Nine times we've done this. Nine Easter's. How exciting. But what's interesting is every Easter, every year, it's a different community that gathers to worship. Every year the community is different. Every year there are new people. Every year there are new visitors and new members. And that's exciting. It's exciting to see new faces, to see people uh, sitting next to people who have never sat next to each other before. And we'll have a chance to meet each other when we share the peace. But it's also a time when we gather with a little bit of sadness because there is an empty chair here and there, a place where someone who has worshipped with us is no longer. The Lord has taken them home, and so we gather as a different community, a community new and a community experiencing loss, loss. But we're not We're not the only ones who experienced that loss. Just wake up this morning and hear that more than 200 people were killed by a bomb. Some while they were in worship at a Christian church proclaiming our Lord's resurrection. Loss and death is part of life. And I don't want to imagine what life would be like without the promise that all will be made alive in Christ. Paul says, if only for this life we are of all people to be most pitied, but all will be made alive. I don't have to imagine that because I trust that when Jesus says all will be made alive, Jesus is going to make that happen. That is going to come true. And so every time we lose somebody, it's not a permanent loss. It's a, I will see you soon. I will see you soon. You know, it's funny. We trust the weatherman, the weather woman. I want to leave out Colleen Coyle. She's great too. Because they're usually right. Because they're usually right. They usually tell us what, what, what's going to happen tomorrow, and that's what happens tomorrow. But trusting Jesus is life-changing trust. It is truly life-changing trust. But I know that there are many people in the world and maybe some who are here today who struggle with trusting Jesus, who have stopped trusting Jesus. Maybe they've heard or seen a religious person do something or say something that was incredibly hateful or judgmental, and they've said, no thanks, I just I don't want any part of that. Maybe something has happened in their life, and they've experienced great loss and great pain, and they can't make sense of it, and they say, I just... I just, I just can't be here right now. Maybe some people have never trusted Jesus. To you, I say, we get it. I get it. We've all been there before. I've been there before. But I want you to know that you are always welcome here. Your doubt is always welcome here. Your difficult questions are always welcome here. And your pain is always welcome welcome here, and we will do our best to share that burden with you. But I also say this to you. 
If you have given up on Jesus, I assure you that Jesus has not given up on you. Imagine for a moment, if you will, how your life might be different if you trust Jesus. You might see more hope in the world. You might see more love in the world. You might see more grace in the world. And you might see more purpose in your life and in the world. But I also say this to you. If you have given up on Jesus, you are in good company. Because the women who went to that tomb that day had given up on Jesus as God. They thought that he was dead and he was going to stay dead. And they were going to prepare the human body of Jesus of Nazareth for his final remains. They were going to bury someone who they loved. But God's power was revealed to them in a very unexpected way. He's not here. He did what he said he was going to do. May God's power and presence continue to be revealed to all of us in the most unexpected of ways so that our trust in Jesus grows more with each passing day. Amen.